Now, I contemplated and I, in fact, planned to have a little exercise for you today, but I, I desisted. Um, I know many of you are in a somewhat desperate state. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I um, elected not to, to go forward. I did, however, take the, pro, the um, scripts that we were working with previously and I elaborated them in some notable ways over the weekend. And I was thinking of having you elaborate them yet further, but um, actually to sort of recreate some of my changes as a little exercise, but I desisted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through some of the things that, that I elaborated, and then we're going to use them to pursue several additional types of machine learning analysis using Spark's ML library. And in fact, using Spark's older ML lib as well, okay, which is an RDD based protocol. Okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, probably the best thing to do right now to, to get us going and use the time well would be to go copy in this, okay? Um, uh, so basically, you'll do an sc.stop in your Spark shell to stop the existing context. And then basically, you're going to go copy everything down to, everything down to this first, where it says, decision tree classifier, okay? And we're gonna go down to decision tree classifier dot fit. Create a decision tree classifier. We're gonna do that and include decision dot, uh, classifier dot fit. Why am I doing that? Because it doesn't need it for the data from the database. Until, until it needs it. And ladies and gentlemen, even the join, even in this join up here, um, uh, this join, even with this random split, those are all promises being handed out by Spark. It's not until it actually needs the data, say, to execute this machine learning algorithm, it's actually going to be brought in from, from the data store. And because we're all going to be doing this together, I'd like, I'd like to give it a bit of time, and I'll walk you through um, what I've done and what we'll be covering. Um, okay, bad thing happened. Oh, okay, well, it's, at least it's the same thing as last time. Um, okay. Um, okay, so, oh, okay. No, that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, time slotted, error, pool was closed during initialization. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to have to. Is it something related to when TCP gets started that we're supposed to I suspect that that would be an explanation for it. Um, it looks like it, it maybe did get some data from it here. I didn't get that. You didn't get it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so maybe, maybe one of you could look into that that um, message a little bit more. Um, okay. 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 Um, meanwhile, so mine's going down and, and doing some significant work here. So it seems that it was able to get data. Were yours able to get data? No. Others? Oh, yeah, mine is. Okay. Get or not? You can get it. Okay, good. So let's let's let it let let's let it do its work. And meanwhile, I'll walk you through some aspects of this code. So one thing is that I modified the code so that whenever we aggregate a three D data source, a data source that includes several axes. Um, we further provide 
absolute values of those axes, okay? So absolute value numbers. I do this for two reasons. First of all, some of the machine learning tools that we'll be looking at today require non-negative inputs. For reasons un unknown to me, the ne naive Bayes one requires non-negative inputs. So uh, to avoid having to just throw out whole classes of data on a per axis basis, I wanted to uh, I wanted it to be able to at least have recourse to, to um, absolute values of things. The second of all, there are some measures like orientation where because of rotations of the phone, the absolute value seemed more relevant than just the actual orientation of the phone. So I wanted to be able to have recourse in machine learning to look at the absolute value of the, of the elements. So can anyone give me, what are three sensors that have three axes associated with them? Yeah, mag I don't know that magnetometer does actually, but it, it, it might. Uh, orientation, orientation. So, so basically whenever you process one of those data sources, Excel orientation gyroscope, it's using this code, which also provides an absolute value measurement, okay? Um, so that's, uh, that's one change. A second change is I brought in GPS here, okay? Now, an important, an important consideration for GPS was that um, it was important that it be aggregated up. So this is in contrast, so this, read and annotate Ethica data frame with time slot. Um, that's what we used earlier for the, um, for the survey responses. And each survey response was held separate. We didn't aggregate survey response, or you know, we didn't aggregate responses to whole surveys. So if there were two surveys in the same time slot, we kept them distinct because you might answer one and not the other. One might be canceled, one might be answered in the same time slot. By contrast, for, for um, GPS, uh, we wanted to aggregate. It's not a three axis thing. The three axis code takes care of aggregation here for those sort of sensors. But for GPS, we still want to aggregate. We wanted to compress the, the different readings as latitude and longitude and accuracy and speed, which occurred in the same time slot. We want to average over them. And so I, I put in some code to do that in addition to adding this GPS uh, component. So now we have recourse to GPS. So if you wanted to be able to judge how does, for example, going in a fast vehicle affect the likelihood of answering questions on the phone, this GPS data could be useful for our machine learning, okay? So I added, added those features in. Um, uh, beyond that, much of the code up top is pretty similar. What I also added in was, was a number of additional uh, classifiers, okay? And we're gonna go through several of them today. So um, this thing is still working here. It looks like it's making good progress. Are your are your folks one still going? I canceled mine today. It's still oh, okay. I I, I appreciate um, the, the the sentiment. That um, reminds me of Spock. Um, the, the good of the many outweigh the, the preferences of the one. Or something well, I'm not like going to do that much because I'll still have to do that. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so I appreciate that. This is uh, much of the way done due in part due to Kurt's um, uh, willingness to, to sacrifice his. Are, are other people still working? That, that response is ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> are, are other people's finished? No? Okay. Okay. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, here we're going to go over three, several types of classifiers. We already did decision tree before. Um, logistic regression, I think we did quite a bit of that last time, perhaps all of it. Um, 
And also last time we split up the data so that we could um, we could perform a form of manual cross validation. So there was this split here, and I'm going to need to go find it right here, where we split the data into different fractions. Okay, and the idea there is, uh, on the basis of that, we could fit the data to one subset, and then tr test it on another subset. Okay. Uh, a methodology that I'm confident you learned about in a class that some of you are fearing this afternoon. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so uh, we did that last time, um, and we're going to continue to do that um, this time. Um, but in addition, um, we use the um, I think we, we started to look at logistic regression last time. Is that right? Mm -hmm. We did logistic regression. Okay. Um, naive Bayes, uh, I don't think we did that last time. And so that will be a big focus for, uh, for this time. Okay. Um, and uh, once it's done, indeed. Yeah. Um, so this is still working on uh, the fit here. Okay. Um, Okay, so we're going to go through the naive Bayes. Now, the naive Bayes classifiers is, as I mentioned earlier, it's a little bit different from the others we've been working with, from decision trees and logistic regression, in that it expects all of its inputs to be non-negative. So this, it has its own feature vector. We're not using, you may remember, up above, uh, we had a feature vector um, assembler. Uh, it was uh, located, so let me go find it here, features, uh, come on, hey, come on, features, oh man, um, come on, uh, features, what, okay, oh, I see, the screen is, is my, my uh, the virtual length is much bigger than the physical length, here we go, um, here we go, so ladies and gentlemen, um, the, uh, okay, um, yes, I, I, I know, I, I, I think, here, here it is, this is it, right? We had previously had a vector assembler, which basically, you may remember, its job in life was, uh, it's a transformer, so its job in life is to transform data sets, and like other transformers in ML library, it takes in a data frame and returns a data frame, okay? Um, now, in order for that to work um, properly here, we needed to delineate for this vector assembler what are the columns that it needs to assemble into a vector in the features column, in a singles features column. So it packs all of these, these ones here into a single place here, okay, into the features, uh, the features vector, okay. Um, you notice none of these are currently right now referring to the abs, though they could, um, since we have those columns as well. So this is a vector assembler we defined earlier, but this included some, like these orientations, for example, um, which were potentially negative. So instead of using that vector assembler, to label the vectors with the features and, and then we added on the labels um, as to ground truth. What instead we, we defined as a new assembler, a new vector assembler, which basically harvested just the, um, uh, just the, the values that were non-negative, okay? Um, and really I should have some additional ones here, including the, oh, here they are, abs. They're the abs, okay? Um, and, uh, and so these, these are the absolute values of those corresponding ones. So this vector assembler um, uh, transformed this data set into a labeled one with a consolidated features column that only includes non-negative values. And what we're going to do now is to fit that 
and I see the code is ready, um, or, or Spark is ready, we're going to use it to fit some data, okay? Um, CPT-898? This is only my computer. No. Okay. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do is we're going to copy this vector assembler um, non-negative here. Okay. And uh, we have to be a little bit we have to be a little bit careful because we had defined earlier a, a a binary classification evaluator that we'll be using. I just want to make sure that we have that as well. Binary classification evaluator. That was defined up here. Okay, that was defined um, uh, previously. So it shouldn't be a, uh, a problem. Um, so you should, uh, I think you will, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, where is it? Uh, here it is. So, um, yes, you would have gotten it then if you came down to decision free classifier. So maybe type in your spark shells here. Part, type in your spark shells this. Make sure it's, it's properly declared. Okay? Okay, so we're going to go through a naive Bayes classifier here. So we're going to copy this code um, down to just before this fit. Okay, and there's a thing called uh, DF labeled non-negative, and um, uh, just to remind us what that includes. So this assembler is being applied to a data frame, and and that creates this features column, which is a, consists of a vector of these features. And then we are further labeling that data frame with uh, an indicator of what the true answer is, what the, what the ground truth situation is. We know whether or not it was answered, okay? So DF labeled, DF labeled non-negative here. And we'll do a, a show of, maybe I'll do a select of the features column and the label column, and I'll do a show of, of 10 here, okay? And it looks something like this, okay? Mm. Um, uh, okay, so alternatively, maybe what I'll do is I'll take the first 10, just so you can see what these look like. I could take the first five and I'll turn this into, oh, 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 oh. okay. Um, sorry? Mm. Um, that's uh, that's interesting. It needs a partial function. Okay, that's that's a little bit different than what I was expecting. Um, uh, okay, well we'll drop that. I was going to turn it into a to an array. Um, no. Um, no, it looks like it, so Aiden, did you have, uh, uh, I thought I heard you say something. Did you have a suggestion here? Yeah, no, it's easier to do. Yeah, I think, because for a lot of data frames, it should work fine when you do collect, so I'm a little bit puzzled by that. Anyway. If you do just the first five, does it say what type it is? Um, yeah, it's a good, good point. I think it's, uh, oh, it's a row. Oh, it's an array, oh, it's an array. Huh? Ooh. Mumble. Okay. Okay, so take. Uh, I think you can like limit it and then you would show. Limit one, limit five. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, limit five. And then maybe I could do a collect. Yeah, okay. Um, that's, that's curious that take actually renders it as an array. I, that was unexpected. but. But the point actually got me to the place I wanted to go to. So this is a representation of the vectors. This is a vector, for example, of features, and this is the ground truth label on it. Okay. Um, 
the features coming from that column originally, the label from this next column, all right? Um, and just so you could see what this looks like, um, you know, rendered here, this is the equivalent of that. So these guys here were the vector from this and the label here is this guy. Okay, so uh, we're in good shape. Now, now we're gonna have it undergo um, a fit, okay? We're going to fit the data frame to this, okay? And it is gonna engage in a, a silicon cogitation, um, which is, is rapid in its convergence. And here we get back a what? What are we getting back out of a fit? So, a f so this thing serves as an estimator. So when we fit it, we get back a what? A model. a model indeed. We're getting back a model here. Now a model is a what? A model is a transformer. So we're gonna be able to transform some a data frame into this. Now, some of these ML lib models, once they're estimated, they include within them a representation of the fit data set. Okay, so so in other words, you could just go into them and grab from within them the uh, the fit data to look at and how they did on that data. There's a thing called summary for some of them, but not for this one, not for naive base, and indeed not for most. Okay, so, so ladies and gentlemen, um, there's our model um, uh, here. So this, this naive Bayes model predictions, okay. Um, yes, this is a data frame, yes. I think, so So my reading of that, I've seen those warnings many a time. Yeah, I, um, I and I think what's going on is that it would like to be able to load in a native and therefore faster implementation of this linear algebra system. So this is a very widespread linear algebra library, which, which um, probably has a JNI implementation that that uses Java native code. In other words, it's a Java native interface. So in other words, it calls off the compiled C code for the type of machine on which this is located. So in short, I think it's making an attempt to make it faster by loading in a, uh, a linear algebra library that would run closer to the metal. In other words, on the, on the native code of the machine, I think it is unable to do that and so it's falling back on a Java virtual machine implementation uh, of that library which is probably somewhat less efficient that that that's my best guess but but that could be totally off base probably I, th I think you know if, if you were to sit and 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 try to figure it out for an hour or two probably and by working with Greg Osters, the system administrator here, you could probably get this in place. So it, would, it could get them and could run more efficiently. That, that's my best guess. If anyone knows a better, you know, has a better understanding of it, you can, you can um, correct me. But that, that, that's my guess as to what's going on. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let's go. Um, so here we have this naive Bayes model predictions. This is a data frame. Is this data frame have the same columns as the input data frame? No. No. It has, an extra it has extra columns indeed. Print schema. What columns are extra here? Prediction. In, in raw prediction. That's right. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's go take a look at um, the prediction, so the label, that's the ground truth, right? And the prediction column. Oh, 
I just said stacked up by, by looking at those. Seems pretty to me. Yeah, so, so it, it <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, well, at least it got a few right. Um, <laughs> if it worse than guessing, then that's better, actually. Yeah, okay, so let's go evaluate this thing. Let's go use our binary classification evaluator to evaluate it. Shall we not? Now, how is this binary classification evaluator working? Against what metric is it evaluating it? No? Against what metric? Okay, that, that response lacked clar full clarity. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it was a little bit of a trick question, but not much of one. Um, the answer is binary class, it, so it is against a particular metric, but that metric is actually something we set. This is the area under the ROC curve, okay? Um, so the ROC curve basically allows you to see on the one axis information related to specificity and the other axis related to sensitivity. Um, although it's defined slightly different than that in its normal form, basically those things directly relate to sensitivity and specificity. So it's used for binary classification, hence binary, and, and it's a very useful metric for, for judging binary classifiers. And we've been using it for the other classifiers. Yes, Kurt? That's correct. Yeah. 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 And then one is sort of That's right. right. Let's look at raw prediction. Let's look at all of them, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, is it or is it raw underbar? No, it's uh, it's raw prediction, I think. Uh, it might be maybe maybe um, um so so it's it's a little bit more involved yeah. Okay. So so let's um, let's let's go limit. Let let's go limit to one, and then let's go do a collect. Right. Let's let's just render it into a form that we can we could parse. Okay. Can anyone help figure out what's going on here? What's this initial one? That's the label. What's zero? So this is it's when it comes down to it, yes or no, it says no. Oh. <laughs> the actual answer is yes. Okay. Um, okay, this is some sort of raw pr prediction a score used, I think, at, on the basis for the for, for this prediction. I actually I think how this is I don't know how this is defined. I'd love to know. Yeah, I suspect it's this is defined on a per classifier basis. So what this means for a decision tree is probably different from yeah, a naive base. Single number if my memory works, and this one. I think that's correct. But, but yeah. nonetheless, my question is, why do you need to give the raw prediction value to your binary classifier, or to your estimator? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I know that some of the machinery does use that information and I'm not I'm not clear about why that is I could imagine maybe it using this for some of the metrics so what are these two numbers why are there two numbers under probability they, probably sum the one. they do indeed and this is what I was hoping to bring out so this is the probability that it's zero and this is the probability it's one no well, no this information could be very helpful for the binary classifier because to reconstruct the ROC curve, the ROC curve basically is going to give the trade-offs involving false negatives and false positives. And knowing what these probabilities are, you could imagine saying, we will treat it as yes, as long as this probability is higher than 0.3 
or higher than 0.2, higher than 0.1. And each of those would give a gif different sensitivity specificity trade-off. If you said this, this number has to be at least 0.1 to count as true, then we would have a very high sensitivity. We would catch a very large fraction of the cases that are in fact true, but we would probably have very low specificity in the sense that we would be treating many ones that in fact are not true as true. And so the ROC curve needs to will benefit from these sort of probabilities here. I'm not clear, Kurt, why it needs this. Do you specify the location of the probability in the definition of? For the uh, binary uh, classifier? This is, this is a good question. No, you don't even do that. No, you just say raw prediction. Indeed. From those first three rows, that's Indeed. the whole sample set. We saw that the time they were performing well, but does it know how to handle arbitrary raw prediction formats? I don't know. Uh, I share okay. I share your puzzlement. And um, I would suggest that this might be a good topic of a further investigation. Okay. Um, but how did the how did our classifier do? Our naive phase classifier. In the end, how did it stack up compared to the decision tree and logistic regression? Seems like toss of a coin. Worse of a, Worse of a toss of a coin. In fact, it'd be it looks to me like the current classification, we could improve on it in a trivial way. How could we improve on this? We just flip. So if it says if it says no, just say yes. And if it says yes, say no. That would be a better classifier. That would be a better classifier, a significantly be better classifier. One, one. That's right. That'd be a pretty good classifier. Yeah, it wouldn't be. By, by the way, that minor something is just a, a it's just a long form of the probability. And ah. And the later ones are the normalizer. And yeah. you can verify that by okay. So the so so um, yes right. Um, or by taking the log of this one, right? Um, no, it's just like the later one is, the, the first one is, first is, 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 is a log form the probability, but the later one is a normalized one. Like oh. It's basically you take, you use EXP to transfer the quizzes to into normal probability, and then you normalize them to get the later, later solution. The later solution is actually one. Uh, these two? Yeah, yeah. The is in chemistry. Okay, so you're saying if we take X but this, right? Yeah. But I, I was thinking that we could take ln of this, no? Uh, maybe, but I thought the later one is doing, it, it, there is also a, a normalization adding up to Oh, I, I see, I I see. Okay, okay, uh, lo I log, log. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, you're right about that. Okay, yeah, so x of this, right? Yeah, okay. Exactly, exactly, okay. So, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, we'll do EXP of the same thing. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. Here we go. Point six two. Yes, wind chill as normal is exactly on the mark. Okay, so in short, Kurt, it sounds like I'm wrong that, that these probabilities differ by classifier, although my recollection also was it was a single number for, for the, uh, for the um, uh, decision tree. But, um, but here, basically those can be used to reconstruct these and therefore they're probably of use in reconstructing the ROC curve. Yeah, exactly, because the yeah. ROC curve would require you to analyze the yeah. statistics at each one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you for both your explications of this. Um,
and thanks to Iden for the uh, the help earlier with the uh, uh, the the collect stuff. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, so the naive bays underperformed, but it gave us an immediate avenue towards an improved classifier, namely by reversing it. Okay, okay. Next, um, I'd like to take a look at a neural network. Okay. Now, neural networks um, are a type of classifier. Actually, we should, before we go on, we should go and take a look. When we train a model, generally we don't want to just leave it at its predictions. We may want to store it away, and we can actually persist them by saving them away. Um, uh, as part of the uh, um, the library, there's this write where we can write it out. But more importantly, well, also importantly, we may be interested in in getting an understanding of their structure. Okay, um, and uh, generally speaking, it differs some by different models, but you can get information out of the model concerning its um, its definition. Okay, so uh, for example, here's this theta, which is going to be defined um, in the context of a um, of a naive Bayes, and here's this thresh thresholds. Okay, um, um, excuse me. Okay, that's that's a parameter. Um, uh, but this data, and in general, uh, by poking around uh, specific for each classifier, you will find some information that can give you the specification of the model that you deduced. So you can write it out as a file, but you can also get access to its parameters, generally speaking, by its definition, by, by doing these things. You can also do a debug I think it's debug string, basically render it as a string. Um, and I'm trying to remember which, uh, is it debug, debug string to, to string, is it? Um, to debug string. To debug string, thank you. Oh, no. Oh. Um, uh, so it's used on the decision tree model? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So somewhat inconsistent interface in terms of that. I thought we used it up there, but um, uh, there should be a way of, of sort of extracting this, um, uh, all the information. Yeah. What's that? The, the thresholds, yeah. Oh, get get thresholds. Okay, uh, thank you. Thresh thresholds. Yeah. Uh, failed to find a default value. It says okay. Um, and I think this this is a parameter itself, right? Yeah. Get um, I think that will get it from the quoted param values. Um, so you can you can set it by a, a name of a param. But let's let's not. Uh, Let's not spend too much time. I, I do want to get on to here neural network, and I want to get on to cross validation. Okay, um, okay. So for neural network, neural networks um, are a type of connectionist model that was that builds on ideas that were first advanced to a lot of excitement and then deflated greatly in the nineteen sixties. And that was with the original connectionist definition of what was called a perceptron. Okay. Now the perceptron is is also a connectionist framework, but it's a much simpler one, and it it couldn't even represent nonlinear relationships. But there was a lot of excitement because the thought that maybe it could help us recreate in silico in a computer mechanisms similar to what we see biologically with neurons. 
Um, and Marvin Minsky um, was involved in kind of deflating this notion that perceptrons would revolutionize computation by showing that they had really strict limitations. They couldn't even represent an exclusive OR function, for example. But later, particularly in the 80s and 90s, the late 80s um, and then uh, the 90s, there, there was a great deal of interest that resumed in connectionist models in the form of neural networks. And neural networks can represent nonlinear relationships in a way that percept the original perceptrons cannot. These are basically graphical models that, um, where we have um, activation levels associated with certain connections between components of that model, and we can use them to characterize surfaces. Now, it turns out with neural networks that they can be mapped to certain types of nonlinear regression statistically, um, but they're very powerful tools for characterizing statistical relationships um, that, that may be nonlinear. Um, and in recent years, there's been, after a period of dormancy, where, where these models had more specialized uses, but they weren't in, 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 in uh, foremost use as machine learning method uh, for, for many years is my perception. They've really resurfaced again with deep learning and, and sort of multiple levels of, of learning. And those techniques have revolutionized treatment of certain types of input. So there's been kind of three waves of connectionist enthusiasm. And we're currently, as we speak, in the middle of the third wave with deep learning networks. And it's to ML's, the ML library's credit that we can define these perceptrons, uh, excuse me, these, these neural networks. So in order to define a neural network, basically we need to recognize that a neural network consists of layers of interconnected nodes. And those nodes are interconnected by connections, each of which has an activation level. Um, and so a key component of specifying these networks is specifying the number of nodes in each of these layers where these layers go progressively forward. And um, here, and I don't know if this is a restriction. We could play around. Um, we have 10, 10 nodes um, in the first layer that correspond to each of our features and two at the end that clear correspond to each of our classes, okay? Each of our output classes, true or false, okay? And what's gonna go on in a neural network is that it will be trained and there's some classic neural network algorithms that date back to, to uh, Hinton um, and McCulloch's work, I think it was, um, uh, back in the late 80s, uh, such as backpropagation, that can be involved in training these networks, training the networks to recognize things and recognize nonlinear structures often. So here I, I have a five-layer network. And in general, the more layers you have, the more computational effort it's going to take. And quite a lot of effort has to go into to, uh, to tweaking at these sort of layers. Um, so that's going to be a key component of, of this uh, network. There's also some other parameters, such as the number of iterations, that are going to have a very big impact on performance. Okay? Now, reflecting this, I'd like to start with a smaller model. Okay? Um, so I think I'm going to change this by cutting out. I'm going to change it to just three layers okay? to cut down our computational effort here. <coughs> we'll still have 10 layers for the, for the features, for each, one for each of the features, and two for the outputs. And now I'm going to create a neural network classifier, which is an estimator from this. Okay. Um, I actually can't speak about what this block size is. I'm puzzled by that, and I haven't had time to, to research it. Okay? Um, so I just uh, defined this. Um, and now I'm going to fit this, this data set here. And really, I probably should have used less than 10,000. Um, uh, we may be in for a long ride. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you might want to switch this to 100, okay? Um, 
and I may have to restart this. I made a, I made a boo boo there. Um, okay. Um, I, I'm using ten thousand. Yeah. Um, and um, I would switch it to a hundred. Okay. Um, we we could see how mine proceeds, um, but my guess is that it will not be quick. Okay. So I may actually restart this, um, um, or I may go over to, uh, okay, um, I'm going to go over to SSH. Here we go, console, okay. Um, I'm gonna SSH over to, to that. I'm gonna do a screen minus what? ls okay i'm going to reattach the screens using screen minus what r good i'm going to reattach this one and then i'll run it over there even as mine runs in front of me okay um here we go great okay back in the high life again okay um great here's oh my gosh there's a neural network model um uh this one was pretty good over the weekend uh i was uh Drawing it. Here's uh, cross validation 71, 72, 0 0.71, 0 0.72. But, but mind you, it's a different metric. Okay, so let's, let's go here. Um, let's go take again this down to just, in fact, I will here. Okay, hey. There we go. Hey. Oh man, I'm all confused. Okay, here we go. We want to get this here, and we're going to train one over on that other machine. Yeah. Um, here we go. Paste. Boom. Okay, now we're going to train our model. Okay. Um, here we go. DF labeled, uh, but we want to, here, neural network classifier small. Okay. Small. Boom. Okay, now we're going to go label this thing here. So I'm just doing this further, further work, okay? Uh, I'm gonna do the small, and I'm gonna say small here, okay? And we're going to fit it. Oh, wait, I should have still, uh, I should have done this with 100. Let's do it with 100. Have you, did you folks do 100? And did it converge? It's still designed. Okay. Okay, well, let a, a thousand flowers bloom. Um, okay, here we go. That was actually something that was on the model training center in the weekend. Well, it was a, it was a earlier expression that was misused. Yeah, 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 unfortunately. We, we abused it. Okay. It is running quick. Oh, wait, wrong. Oh, you're running on the server. I'm running on the server. Okay. So I set it to 100 layers with the small. Um, oh, uh, yes. A ray count layer. It has a lot of stages. <laughs> What's that? It has a lot of stages. Yes, it is. So neural network classifier actually requires a great deal of computation. Um, and uh, one thing I found is actually um, that, uh, that because of that, it's especially important that the data that you're manipulating be in memory, be cached appropriately, so that it is accessed uh, quickly. You'll notice that it's, it's up to stage 47,000. However, mind you, these stages are cumulative. Yeah. So some of those were accumulated over the weekend. Okay. Um, so it's just labeling those uh, subsequently. Neural networks, though, are a highly computationally expensive technique um, when used here. So you have to be able to, to give them the requisite time to converge. Okay, um, and indeed this one is still converging. Okay, um, 
So we can go through and, and do these in different subsets of data, et cetera. You'll notice this one is, is still running. Um, but one of the main things I wanted to talk about today, to introduce today, was actually uh, a higher level mechanism for performing pipelines of computation, okay? Uh, here within, uh, within Spark. Um, and to show a common example of this, I created a mechanism which will involve setting up a cross validator, okay? Um, that will involve, on the one hand, estimating a model uh, and then using a certain evaluator um, over a certain number of times of iteration to test it out. Um, uh, so this is number of folds of cross-validation, okay? Um, so number of different subsets of the data. So we're going to go uh, execute this, and really this is going to bundle all those together in one transformer, or one estimator, which is going to take in a data set and therefore return some output out of which we can extract the model, okay? Um, so hopefully this thing is done, and indeed my hopes are rewarded um, here. So we have a neural network small. Let's go test how this neural network small stacks up, shall we not? So we did a small neural network. Here we go, neural network. And we are going to create an evaluator for that neural network. Okay, here we go. Paste, here's our neural network evaluator. You'll notice that this uses a special evaluator. It's not using the binary evaluator, okay? Presumably because it can allow for multiple, multiple classes here. But we're, we're evaluating it against accuracy here. Now accuracy can be a misleading statistic. Why can it be misleading? Why, why does one have to be cautious about interpreting accuracies? Is it the opposite of what it is? Well. Higher accuracy gives you really a higher error than the estimator? Yeah, so the, the accuracy, you know, if, if 80% of your cases someone didn't answer the survey, you could have really high accuracy just by saying no all the time. You're not getting that understanding of what's the sensitivity and what's the specificity associated with what fraction. You're not getting the full confusion matrix. Instead, you're just asking what fraction of the time is it correct? Well, it can be correct in kind of a trivial way. Um, in this case, um, we do have an accuracy that you know, it doesn't seem trivial, but we'd want to look at the underlying statistics here. Um, but um, here, ladies and gentlemen, we are getting good results, seemingly, out of a quite small neural network. Okay? Um, well, that's a different measurement from the It is. Right? It, it can't be compared. These are apples and oranges. Yeah. Okay. 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 So that was our neural network there. Um, uh, next, I'd like to go on to our cross-validator, okay? So again, this is demonstrating a type of pipelining of sorts, okay? So within this framework, we're going to first go define a number of cross-folds that we want to perform. It's going to be perform these. Up above, we had manually perform cross-validation of sorts with these labeled subsets one and two. Now we're, we're gonna have it do it. And maybe, maybe instead, just to give us a little bit more flexibility to make it clear that we're avoiding a fair bit of work, I'm gonna increase this number. I'm gonna increase it to four. Could be 10, right? 10 full cross validation. Next. I'm going to create a Okay, now this is creating a binary classification evaluator. I don't actually know that we need to do that um, because we above defined an earlier one, I think, right? 
binary classification evaluator here. So we should be able to, I believe, just use that. Um, uh, so I'm not going to actually create a new one there. Um, I think we should be able to now define this parameter grid. So here we're going to define a grid which is going to basically specify over what ranges to vary different parameters. Now, you may have been puzzled, perhaps even perplexed, by, by the fact that when I inquired within these classifiers at times, oh, OK, what, what's going on here? Copy, here we go, paste. Watch this. If I go, you'll notice there are these things here, set max bins, for example, for a decision tree classifier, right? Set, set the um, max depth. Um, there's going to be this one max depth we're going to use. You'll notice for each of those, not only is there that, but there's a get, a corresponding get, get max bins, get max depth. Do you see that? So set and get. And as you might expect, get max bins, for example, returns you know, the current setting, get max depth. But you might be confused and perhaps even perplexed to, to note there's also beyond that a thing that just says max bins. Do you see that? And there's a thing that says max depth. But you'll notice that if, if you went to those to try to naively think they're going to give you the numbers, they're not. What are they going to give you instead? Parameters. parameters. We have reified the parameters. We've turned the parameters into an object here. Now, you may wonder about why that is. Why are we turning the parameters into an object? Well, among other things, it supports this semantics. So we can explicitly create a parameter grid by mentioning what is the parameter we wish to iterate over. And what are the values over which we wish to iterate? Now, as you'll see later, you can actually do this over many at the same time. Okay? So adding the grid, we can, we can actually have many dimensions of iteration. And for each of them, we'll specify a parameter and what are the values over which it, to, it should iterate. No, it's a full matrix. So it's a, a full how, factorial. How do you, do it? you wanted to covariate. You could look it up. You could have okay. one parameter go and look up the okay. values so of the others. Yeah. Um, you, there needs there need to be some additional machinery to, mm -hmm. to handle that. But um, okay, so um, here we're going to build this parameter um, parameter grid from this here for. Simplicity, we've only specified one, one dimension. But it's the very fact that we can name the parameter that allows us to specify those grids so easily. Okay? Um, next, we're going to define a cross-validator. Now, this cross-validator uh, cro cross is going to set an evaluator, which is going to be based on this binary classification evaluator here. Okay? Um, and it's going to use this grid as its parameter maps, indication of what to modify. It's going to use this as its classifier, this decision tree classifier that we defined earlier. Uh, and it's going to use a number of folds of cross-validation as specified by us. Okay? So here we are. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's our cross validator. Cross validator will serve to estimate models, right? So here's our decision tree. So it specifies how to evaluate things, to judge what's best. It's going to give us, we're, we're going to tell it what we use to perform the cross-validation and 
what parameters we want to vary over what value, and what are the folds of cross-validation. You may remember I set that to four. So having done that, we can use it to fit a time series, okay? So I'm going to do this, or excuse me, a, a, a data set here, okay? Here we are. Um, so it's going to be working here, and while working, it's going to be varying this parameter. It's going to be judging each of those, and it's going to try to identify the best model according to the criteria we specified earlier for this evaluator, okay? This binary classification evaluator, we had specified earlier the area under the ROC curve as the metric for evaluation. And so the cross-validation framework is basically going to be identifying the model that is most suitable um, given those criteria. And we're going to be able to access that model in this way. We're going to be able to take what comes out of this fit and we're going to be able to ask for the best model from it. We're also going to be able to here take this cross validator and using that best model fit a data set and ask, um, ask about the average metrics, for example, um, uh, associated with, uh, I think it's with that best model, but I'll have to check that. Um, maybe it's across all models examined, actually, I'm, I'm wondering. Um, uh, okay, and um, yes. A brief question. Yes. Um, so I guess I was under the impression that the cross-fold validator mm -hmm. is it's a repeated of that. So what we did before was this manual cross-fold validator. That's correct. Split it, yep. And then you train it on yep. the Yep, and it's doing the same thing here, yeah. But then this also seems like a primary variation of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it, it's correct. Like, Correct. Um, so it's a great question. So this is performing cross validation. It's performing a sort of optimization where it's identified. It's more like a, a, a almost a calibration experiment where it's varying the parameter values to identify the best combination of parameter values according to the evaluation metric that you're using right, and giving you the best model. Sorry? That's a different process, right, than cross-fold validation. We're doing both of right, it's testing the robustness of those. So is it doing a cross-fold validation for each of those three yeah. precision yeah. mass yeah. exercises? Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is so why... So you just do a cross-fold validation. Instead of doing this evaluator, yeah. cross-fold validation is a more mature way to evaluate the, the so efficacy it, Sure. Certain if you had a certain model and you wanted to do cross cross validation on it, you could you could do so by thanks God. Um, you could do so by um, setting it so that um, it only it doesn't vary the parameter at all, right? Um, it just the is. Each, one of them out that's right. Yeah, so, so really what you're testing is you're yeah. not testing a specific model, but you're, you're testing a, a family testing, of models. You're, you're testing a, a model of the parameters. Like you set the parameters of that model, so it's going to be for a certain duration of a certain depth and a certain the, depth. Well, precisely. So, so, yeah, I guess it, it gets a little bit into what's the definition of the model. And you'll notice this model here is a very particular model. It is a model of a certain depth. And a, and a certain number of nodes. That was found to be the best model 
through cross-validation when systematically varying these parameter values across these ranges, it found that you know, depth seven seemed to offer the best uh, predictive abilities of, of all of these as judged through cross-validation using this metric here. Uh, yes, but you could use a different metric that would take into account the model complexity, for but example. But it might not, because last time we saw how, how, That's true. how having That's a good more, point. Yeah. like it has a higher chance to, to become overfit to the training data and not be able to predict, so. That's right. So it, it, you know, with, okay, then, with, then really we have two variables we're varying. The, the number of, fo or not the number, the number of folds and the depth, because the point is, train on one of your folds and you or you train on all but one of the folds and you test the last one, the more folds you have, the bigger your training sets, correct? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're partitioning data 10 ways, yep. you're using 90% of the data to, to train it and 10% of it, yep. the more training data you give it, the more likely you're going to overfit it. Well, the but validation makes it to, uh, to avoid It changes which one is right, no, which I one is know selected. Right, it's each of them and, and, and tries to find some, you know, diff uh, difference. I'm I'm just pointing out that I mean, my 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 only concern here is the with with a large number of folds. If every if every iteration is overfitting, but it gives you the same answer, like it's overfitting to the same degree with each of them, you won't see a difference in the in the predictive power. It'll just be min, I think. But so I guess what we're doing here is we're so we're running a depth seven mm -hmm. over a tenfold car fourfold cross yeah. fold validation. Yeah. Right? Fourfold the and a five and a three. And then a five and a three and, and, and what it seems to be saying is that in general the seven works better. Well but in, it, it, in it in doesn't general, say it doesn't say necessarily that it works better for each of those combinations. For each combination of the cross fold, you're saying? Right. Yeah. So yeah, when you do that's a four correct. fold validation, that's you're, correct. Doing, you're doing three yeah. on three and then do the other one. Yes. So there might be four different versions of that cross fold validation. That's right. Yeah, and in fact I think that's what this average metrics gives. So this comes out of you remember when we ran this, mm -hmm. we got this cross validator for decision tree, which we then used to, to fit a particular data set. And we got out of this. So, so these cross validation results, okay, um, that we got out, we, we used them to fit a particular data set. That's a little bit non intuitive. Um, and that yielded us a model, okay. Um, here and these cross validation results if we look at the average metrics for this um, I think these are for successive values of that parameter three five, three, five, and, seven, yeah. uh, three, five and seven yes um, uh, but wait a minute this is saying it is depth seven so depth seven is the best model is the best model that's three, correct three, five, Yes, and it's three, five, seven. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's quite right. So the best model here, yes, was this one, but it includes all models, and so this is just summarizing over those those different models. Okay. Um, right. Um, if we did another add grid. Would it be doing a two-dimensional in the paren grid builder? Um, so say that again. Yeah. So we'll be doing two-dimensional. Yeah. 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 So. Um, so, okay, so I guess I didn't define this decision tree model from cross-validation with the best model, and we can use that to transform a data set, and here we go, okay, we transformed uh, that data set, or we extracted a promise, and we could go look at the difference between what its prediction is and what it the ground truth is, and you could see here that well, it's it's hard to uh, you can't scroll up here, but there's certainly some differences, but um, certainly there's a lot of cases where it does uh, does match. Okay, um, and then looking at this, 
This is uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, classifications. This is this this cross validated model with the best the best model only. Um, you get 73 percent for labeling this. Now. It's interesting that that's different than the average metrics yeah. would suggest, and I'm uh, trying to puzzle why that uh, why that is. Um, this is this is a, uh, a significantly higher number, um, but this cross validation will basically perform that cross validation at the same time as the other thing. So here's uh, here's an example of a twofold cross validation. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, a, a two-fold um, uh, parameter variation yeah. um, or parameter optimization where we are modifying a regularization parameter for logistic regression and then we are modifying a tolerance um, vis-a-vis -vis the search. So there it will be varying, it will be considering the Cartesian product of there, all possible combinations of them. And, and where you can specify more I'm not aware of any mechanism for doing that right now. So again, I think you'd have to look it up. What you do is you'd specify one value that goes, you know, one, you know, certain index essentially, and you could look it up in a in a table. Um, okay. Um, time is up, and I know.